A lot of the focus currently here in India uh, is on digital transformation. It's on building out our digital infrastructure. A lot of work has already gone into that, whether we talk about what's happened at the government end or we talk about the private sector's participation in taking that journey forward. Uh, I have with me a diverse set of panelists here who are each going to talk about their individual stories and more importantly talk about why they're placing their bets on India. So very quickly, let me start by uh, by getting right into the heart of the matter. Uh, Mr. Ekong, thanks very much for joining us here. Ericsson has a long standing history and association with India. It's been a long committed investor uh, in the Indian telecom story. Let me start by asking you about how you view India at this point in time. Just before, ladies and gentlemen, we, we came out here, Mr. Ekholm told me that he was, if he was 25, India would be the place that he would be. Why is that? Uh, we're, we're, of course, uh, very excited to be in India. We came to India in 1903, so we've been here uh, very shortly, 120 years. Uh, that was installing the first fixed switch. Uh, since then, we moved on and moved much more into wireless. And, of course, we're very excited about India. It's our biggest single uh, employment base. We have more than 25,000 here. Uh, more than 2,000 in R&D, more than 500 in AI. So for us, this is one of the bigger commitments we have. Uh, we have almost one in four employees in India today. And uh, what we are excited about is, of course, the build-out of 5G that's happening here uh, and the earlier build-out of 4G. And why is that exciting? Well, I think the consumer actually digitalized on top of 4G. So we saw all the big consumer applications uh, developing over the last few years. We've seen them develop in the two countries that built out the first 4G networks in the world. That happened to be the United States and it happened to be China. So almost all jobs in the consumer sector or digitalizing the consumer were created there. And we have some really big companies. Think about Facebook, Google, Amazon, etc. But we have Alibaba, Tencent in, the, in China. With 5G, we're going to digitalize society. We're going to digitalize enterprises. And those jobs will be created in the country where the digital infrastructure is built out first. And the 5G, with the pace India is, is building out 5G, it will have the most modern infrastructure, digital infrastructure in the world. And that's why I am excited about India, but that's also why if I would be 25, I would move to India. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's good to hear, uh, and we hope other 25-year-olds around the world are listening to what you have to say. But, Mr. Lundberg, let me uh, address the very same issue with you as well. Uh, you know, you had a meeting with the Prime Minister recently, uh, uh, and you discussed, of course, the Digital India opportunity. Uh, Nokia has also been a committed investor here in India. You're also excited about what 5G means for India, for the Indian economy, and for you as a company. Take me through uh, the, the bull case for digital transformation in India today. Well, first of all, India has quickly grown to our number two country or market in the world. And uh, it is also for us the number one country in terms of employment. We have about 16,000 employees here, large manufacturing base. We are exporting from India. We are building, for example, 5G base stations here that we are exporting to other parts of the world at a significant technology and R&D development base, uh, base as well. Um, echoing what, with, what uh, Burya, Burya just said, uh, uh, the Indian opportunity is significant. And what I believe is really impressive is the way how India has been build, systematically building the digital ecosystem. Uh, digital identity for this larger population, impressive achievement digital payments, making the society uh, more and more um, cashless, uh, and now the most uh, ambitious and the fastest, uh, by a big margin, 5G rollout um, in the world. These all are building blocks for the future economic growth um, in any country, and India is really taking a lead in uh, this respect. Most of the value through this technology has so far been created uh, 
uh, through consumer applications, but the next big thing in India will be industrial digitalization, manufacturing industry 4.0, and the, the opportunity to use this platform that you've been building to attract more and more manufacturing and also, very importantly, R&D to the country. Well, I'll address R&D in just a second. I know each one of you has uh, plenty to say on that issue. Uh, but, you know, if you were 25, would this be the place that you wanted to be? <laughs> Absolutely. This would be one of the most attractive places to be. And, of course, the, the population is, uh, is, is young. Average age is much, much lower than in most other parts uh, of the world. So everything that is going on in the world, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, that India will be one of the key winners. You know, for both Ericsson as well as for Nokia, India is one of your top markets, uh, as well as a top employment market as well, with your uh, largest employee base outside of your home markets, outside of your home countries. Uh, future incremental investments, you talked about the export opportunity and how you're actually exporting base stations out of India. What is that going to mean over the next five years in terms of incremental investments, in terms of adding capacity here in India? Well, of course, our Indian customers are investing a lot. And, and uh, when you said that this would be our largest base outside of our home, no, actually, this is our largest base in employment globally. Oh, okay. It's the number one country, and it's also a number one manufacturing country globally. And now everything we are currently seeing, not only in India, but in other parts of the world, means that we are going to be increasing our manufacturing capacity. Here we are doing it right away, and we are also increasing the R&D uh, investment. So the future is looking pretty bright here. Okay, the future is looking bright. I was hoping that you would quantify how bright it is with a, with a number. Are you, are you willing to do that? <laughs> Well, that depends on how you define the scale. We have 16,000 people at the moment, and we are going to most likely be, be uh, a much larger employer here in the future. <laughs> but uh, I am going to disappoint you, and I'm not going to quote you a number that how many okay. people. But I will, give, I, will, I will give you one number, which uh, is actually in public domain. Uh, we had 30% growth here last year, uh, about uh, 1.2 billion uh, Euro uh, sales, that growth is accelerating from the base of 30% growth. So this is clearly our fastest growing market at the moment. Well, that's nothing to scoff at. Uh, uh, to be able to grow on that kind of a base and accelerate growth on that kind of a base uh, is significant. But Sandeep, let's talk about the opportunity that both uh, Mr. Lundmark as well as Mr. Ekholm spoke of, and that is the opportunity of building applications out of India uh, for the world. How are you seeing that happen? You know, we talked about Facebook uh, or Meta now and, uh, and the companies that evolved uh, at the start of the uh, internet era. And and the expectation now is that with the advent of 5G, uh, with what we're already seeing as far as SaaS companies building from India for the world, this is only likely to pick up pace and accelerate further. How do you read the landscape today? Absolutely, Shireen. And you know, there are two types of digital transformation that's happening, right? The one transformation is the Bharat transformation, which is focused internally on India. And there you see Jandha and Aadhaar, the mobile penetration. Uh, Oaken, ONDC, uh, Aishman Bharat. That's the Bharat digital transformation that's happening for the country, by the country, by the people of the country. We have the largest base of software developers in the world today, with over 5 million software developers sitting here in India. India as a country graduates about 1.5, 1.6 million engineers a year. Think about what that's going to do. And these resources are very highly valuable resources. As the world is moving towards cloud-based infrastructure, as the world is getting digitized, the one country that can truly provide the workforce for the rest of the world indeed is India. So I believe that a lot of companies, including enterprise SaaS companies, that are getting built out of India because now India has the 5G infrastructure, has the best-in-class technology to build these particular APIs, we believe that there's tremendous market opportunity and market value creation that will happen from India. I've said this before as well, you know, about close to a trillion dollars of market cap got created in India in the last two decades because of IT services and BPO. My belief is that the next decade, another trillion dollars of market cap will get created for Indian companies that are focused on enterprise SaaS. So huge opportunity going forward in terms of what work from India can afford for the rest of the world.
Professor Narayanan, you know, I also want to get each one of you to talk to us about what you see as the global challenges. That, because at this point in time, while India is relatively better positioned, we are not decoupled from what's happening in the rest of the world. And the world is vulnerable, whether we talk about inflation, we talk about interest rates, we talk about energy, we talk about food security. Uh, as uh, a CEO today, uh, you know, how are you mapping the risks, the known knowns, and the unknown unknowns as well? I think it's a very good question, uh, Shireen. I think one of the first tasks of the, that I have as a CEO is to manage uh, the, the environment, the consequences, and the risks that I face here domestically. And I think one of the things is that, uh, and I've alluded to this before as well, I think the specter of inflation, especially food inflation, is still on us. Uh, we cannot wish it away, and we cannot assume that uh, it's not going to be haunting us for a while. This clearly has implications in terms of uh, price values, in terms of uh, costs, in terms of, uh, of, of incomes, expenditures, and all of that. Uh, coupled with this, of course, the, 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 the fact that we are a consumption-driven economy gives us a lot of hedge in terms of some of the global volatilities that we have, especially on things like... Uh, fuel and, uh, and, and, uh, and other uh, uh, raw materials that uh, we might tend to import over a period of time. But I think the important issue for us is really uh, to use the opportunity that we have today of digitally transforming our businesses across the value chain. And I think there is so much of money to be unlocked in the value chain of organizations, be it logistics, be it procurement, be it quality management, be it manufacturing conversion, be it efficiencies in channel management, consumer management, etc. There is a huge unlock that is still available to organizations here. Again, taking the point of Sandeep on technology arbitrages and town talent arbitrages. So really for me, the agenda is really full with all the opportunities that I can unlock locally and also with the overall consumer sentiment being reasonably positive. Uh, I think there is a full task here to be done rather than getting myself worried unduly about, I like the war to end one day, but whether that is going to have a direct impact on me today. Honestly, it is more what I do in the organization and how the Indian environment treats me that is more important than what's happening globally. Absolutely. You can only control what you can control at this point in time. Uh, but Mr. Ekholm, you know, I want to understand from you the global perspective as well. Uh, you know, Mr. Narayanan spoke about the war in Europe, uh, and that continues uh, now into its second year. Inflation, interest rates, all of that has dented consumer sentiment. All of that has dented the business environment and business confidence as well. What are you hearing from your customers uh, outside of India at this point in time? And how are you uh, dealing with building out a pipeline in this era of uncertainty? I mean, um, I, I will be honest to say I'm not a macroeconomist, I'm an engineer, so I provide that. But we talk to customers, and what's quite clear is uh, the U.S. economy, and, and really, I mean, there are a couple of challenges that we could be afraid of. Uh, but if you start on the economic part, the U.S. is actually quite strong, seems to be doing fine. Uh, we hear, you know, temporary slowdown is what we see among our customers, but the fundamental economy is in good shape. Uh, and, and or has a good demand profile. Europe, on the other hand, is a big question mark. And of course, it's related to the war in Ukraine that have dented the, the quality, the consumer sentiment, but it's also very high inflation, very high food inflation, very high inflation on cost of living uh, that's actually removing a lot of consumer call it income from the market. So I, I think Europe is a big question mark where it's heading. Uh, and, and today, you know, if we look on the digital world, Europe is not the role model. Uh, Europe is not building out the digital infrastructure, etc. So I, I see big concerns about Europe when we talk to our customers. Uh, and that, that to me is, is worrisome. We're a European company. We still have a European base. So for us, Europe is important. But I would also say that, that I do think technology is actually uh, one of the key 
solutions for the future. Uh, the reason why the U.S. is performing so well is, of course, on the back of, even though we read about job losses in the tech sector, the reality is most of the people that lose the job at one company are re-employed in another one very quickly. Yeah. Because the, the, the value of technology is so big. Uh, and it's, it's going to be part of the solution here. And I, I see when I look out, digitalization of enterprises and society is just at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing that run its runway yet. As we make manufacturing more efficient, we make it consume less energy, we make supply chains more efficient, consume less energy, that's going to be part of what solves the general economic picture. Helps fight inflation, helps increase accessibility. So I'm, I'm actually a big believer that, yes, it may look a little bit dark right now with yeah. geopolitics, the economy, etc. But technology is going to be part of the solution for addressing these really big challenges. Absolutely. It could provide that buffer uh, that we've all uh, spoken of and is much needed at this point in time. Mr. Lundmark, uh, I want to understand from you and get your, uh, you know, context on the global environment as well. You, you've been on a whirlwind uh, whistle stop tour around the world from the U.S. Uh, to Europe and, of course, now here in India. Uh, what, are the, what are the signals that you're picking up in terms of how long, uh, you know, this, this road of uncertainty is likely to be? Are clients holding back on spending uh, in other parts of the world at this point in time? Despite the economic in uncertainty, we are not seeing any huge cuts in spending. There have been cases here and there, but in the big picture, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm also an engineer. I'm not an <laughs> economist, so that makes us two engineers in the, in the panel and, uh, and three, three engineers. What, what about else? you, Mr. Narayan? Economics. Economics, okay. So we have, we've okay. got three engineers and an economist. <laughs> so, so as one, one of the three engineers, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this from uh, the technology potential point of view. And, and the, the key reason why I'm optimistic in the big picture is that... Uh, only about 30% of the world economy is digitalized compared to what the full potential is. And uh, as we all know, which was already mentioned here, I mean, the technology we are providing is uh, a central part of the answer to pretty much all key problems that the world is facing. Battling climate change, yeah. uh, one key element in that is that we need to digitalize the whole energy system. It's uh, very much also a communications uh, connectivity challenge when we balance uh, demand and supply in a, an energy system that has more and more weather dependent uh, uh, renewables. You can mention almost any sector of the industry, and yes, we have only scratched the surface in transport. We are wrapped by asking each one of you to, to take us through what the plans are in terms of spends on your own digital transformation. A lot has already been done, but what more and where do you intend to put the money to work at this point in time, since you are also talking about how this can be potentially a lever to mitigate some of the risks we spoke of. So I think uh, <clears throat> one thing is very clear, uh, Shireen, for, for Nestle, India is important and will always remain important. So if you look at our overall investments in this country, uh, we have talked in the region of about 5,000 crores in the next three years. We spent 8,000 crores in 60 years. We're going to spend 5,000 crores in three years. We're looking at our, our places for our 10th factory, maybe our 11th factory. So there is, there is a lot of uh, positivism uh, and born out of performance. This is not a let's hope for the best. This is based on performance of the, of the organization and of the consumer. Really, three areas is where we will be putting our monies on the digital part. Number one is on the consumer. I think the consumer piece is absolutely exploding. I must confess, uh, Shireen, I don't understand 90% of that technology, uh, but I am still given to believe I've asked them simple questions on what does it do to the consumer. And really, this, the, the whole, whether it is everyday artificial intelligence or whether it is a metaverse or whether it is uh, the super app that people are talking about, uh, I think the consumer end is really very, very exciting for us. So that's number one. Number two is the sourcing end. And I think, I think uh, it was alluded to earlier in terms of what can be done uh, in the agricultural sector. One of the big things for me, the dream for me is that every single spice that I use 
every grain of wheat that I use, if I'm able to trace it back to a farm for a consumer and say, this is the assurance that I'm able to give you of the quality and veracity of what I'm giving you, not just as a brand name Nestle, but in terms of ingredients, I think it will be a big deal. That can happen, Shireen, only with digital. There's no other way in which, and I can't have people counting uh, the chilies and the, and the mustard seeds uh, from where they come and how they go. So that's the second piece. The third piece, I think, the company globally and locally is wedded to sustainability. Sustainability involves not just things like water conservation, plastics, and, 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 uh, and uh, dairy farming, but also involves enormous amounts of technological inputs uh, in areas of efficiencies, effectiveness, and, uh, and cost management. All of this we are seeing now increasingly as a company becoming more digitally oriented. So these three areas would really be the, the, the prime focus. Sandeep Naik, Mr. Ludmark, Mr. Ekholm, and Suresh Narayanan, thank you very, very much for joining us here, for sharing your thoughts and your insights on what the road ahead looks like.